Welcome to the Martin Museum and Martin Guitar, Jeff. Really nice to have you here. Thrilled to be here. Really. So, nice. um, really love your playing. I uh, wish I could do that. Okay. Thank you very much. It's very nice <laughs> of you. You're, you're not bad yourself, sir. Yeah. How how did you uh, how did you get started with guitar and your influences? Um, I, uh, I moved to New York City to become an actor in 1976. I was 21 years old. Do the math. And was it like 10 years ago? Yeah, yeah. I'm almost. Uh, I'm just over 40. And but I bought a guitar at Herb David Guitar Studio. It wasn't a Martin. I just bought a guitar and took it with me to just learn. Just I figured I'd be sitting in my apartment forever waiting for the phone to ring, and it proved to be true. But while I was there, creatively none of which I knew at the time, I was in my early 20s, but looking back, creatively I kept alive. Creatively, I, I learned how to play, I learned finger picking, I took Stefan Grossman's tablature books that he We had. know him. Yeah, oh, I do too, and he just was instrumental in me getting me to do the thumb and the whole finger picking thing. And I just would spend days in my apartment waiting for the phone to ring for an acting job, getting better and going to school on the guitar. And so that, that, creatively, it was the one thing in my life I could control, and that was uh, this thing. So you, um, what about influences? I, you know, I hear all types of different uh, things in your music. The first uh, concert I ever went to, and I was still in high school, my parents drove me and my friends because we, 15 I guess, and it was Arlo Guthrie at the Masonic Temple in Detroit. And I loved the, I just, he had an acoustic, he told stories. I mean, you know, Arlo is so funny. He's the, the, the wit and the wisdom and the, that whole, I just loved it. And then, I mean, there were, you know, it was Led Zeppelin, it was Elton John and all of that, but then it was Stevie Goodman. Oh, yeah. Then it was John Prine. And um, I, I just kept paying attention to guys like that. And then I saw Stevie Goodman at the bottom line in New York City, late 70s, early 80s. City of New Orleans. Yeah, but... And, but he played it, oh, yeah, he, yeah. he strummed it. I mean, he really, you could hear the train. And, but he was up there with just his guitar. No band, nothing, sold out, and he held him. And the energy and that whole kind of the craft, Arlo does this too on occasion, the craft of walking out there with nobody else right. and holding them for 90 minutes and making them think that they had a full evening and they weren't bored and all that stuff. Well, you know, your, your skills as an actor uh, must bring a tremendous amount to your musicianship, do, do you think? They do, and, and, and again, but seeing also people like Christine Lavin, the ability to relate to that audience, and, and, act, and act, yeah, you know where the timing in it is, you know where the jokes are, but she, Stevie Goodman and Christine were the first people, that, and Arlo, that gave me, it was like, okay to be funny. It was okay to write a song like, it's not that she don't love me, she just don't like me anymore. And not have to feel like you're trying to write for, um, um, you know, billboard charts or anything. So it was, it was, it was, I gravitated towards those people that made you feel like they had just come to your living room and were sitting on your couch and were going to, were told to entertain you for an hour and a half. Well, those, so those songs I think are brilliant. You know, the, the, um... Uh, they have a they have a nice twist, but they're it reminds me of Paul Simon or something. The amount of thought and uh, verbiage and intelligence that he puts into his lyrics. Well, on my end too. Then you get into where I came from, where I grew up, artistically in New York. We're around these playwrights. That's their business is words. Words are what that's how they make their living, and that led, that bled into songwriting. But playwrights like Lanford Wilson, who went on to win a Pulitzer Prize. And then I'm doing movies. You got Jim Brooks on Terms of Endearment and the way he would slave over a, two or three lines. And then Woody Allen in The Purple Rose of Cairo. Woody would come in and he'd, he'd, we'd do two or three takes and then he would rewrite it. And I was always fascinated with what's he, why is he changing it? What did he change it to? And why did he do that? That whole writing process. So the care for words. And that bleeds right into songwriting because you have to be so much more efficient and, and you have less and, and you have really have to find ways to say a lot in just one line. The three songs that you played, uh, the last one was Grandfather's Hat. What were the first two? First one was uh, uh, When My Fingers Find Your Strings. It's that you know, song that everybody writes for their guitar. But so that's a perfect guitar song. 
It is, and it's and it's a love letter to uh, to this thing. It, it you know it's it's it becomes your best friend. You know. The second song was. Second song was a, fun, a song called uh, "It's Not That You Don't Love Me, You Just Don't Like Me Anymore." It's that anyone who's ever been in a relationship and she turns to you and go, you know, and she says it, and it's, and then let the repair work begin.